Hello, my name is Annie Tumano, and I'm Head of Special Collections and Archives at the Queens College Library. And today I'm going to be talking about the public domain and cultural heritage materials. So there are wealth of cultural heritage materials that can be uh, adapted and reused without restriction, but users are often confused, unaware, or face barriers to actually taking advantage of this. I see the role it, it as a role and ethical responsibility of archivists and curators to make public domain materials more widely accessible. Unfortunately, archives and museums do have a history of playing the role of gatekeepers of cultural heritage materials rather than community facilitators. Um, so this is kind of a legacy that I think uh, many in the sector are working hard to try to overcome. There have been a lot of strides, especially in the last six years or so um, in this area. So during this presentation, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what those strides have been, just a few examples, as well as some of the interesting results that have come about from um, some collections being more accessible online. So first in 2016, the Right Statements Initiative launched um, and it was launched by the Digital Public Library of America and Europeana, which are both um, aggregators of digital cultural heritage materials. Uh, why was this done? Uh, at the time, there was no widely used standard for expressing copyright status. And in the Digital Public Library of America content alone, contributing organizations had used over 87,000 different right statements. So as you can imagine, uh, users trying to navigate this site uh, didn't find any uniformity and often had trouble navigating um, these very disparate statements. Um, the right statements that were used often lacked clarity and or created unnecessary barriers such as charging fees or subjecting users to lengthy permissions processes, even for items that are in the public domain. So rightstatements.org is a collaborative approach to write statements that can be used to communicate the copyright status of cultural objects and which allows data to become more standardized across the world. So it's essentially a set of um, specific write statements that um, those sharing materials can choose from in a standardized way to express the right status of the object at question. And as the initiators say, in terms of their mission, we believe that everyone should be able to engage with their cultural heritage online. Uh, libraries, archives, and museums are also looking for ways to improve access, and they want to help cultural heritage institutions work towards this vision by making it easier for users to understand what they can do with a digital object they discover. Um, around the same time in January 2016, the NYPL announced that out of copyright materials in NYPL digital collections were now um, available as high resolution downloads. As the NYPL statement said, no permission required, no hoops to jump through, just go forth and reused. The removal of administration fees and processes from public domain comment, uh, content is, uh, and improvements to interfaces popular and technical to the digital assets themselves um, is a simplification and enhancement of digital access to a treasure trove of materials. And these changes are intended to facilitate sharing among uh, scholars, artists, educators, technologists, publishers, and internet users of all kinds. So just to give a quick preview of what it looks like, if you go to the NYPL digital collections and you use their search keyword, you can actually just check here that you only want to search public domain materials. Let's say I put in Empire State Building. Get a bunch of very nice results. I'm going to click on this one. And you'll see the right statement expressed very clearly in down to earth language, free to use without restriction and varying download options, including the highest resolution original TIFF file. You can download right here. Oops, go back. And then in February, 2017, about a year later, the Met made um, all images of public domain works in its collection available open access. And as their statement said, whether you're an artist or a designer, an educator or a student, a professional or a hobbyist, you now have more than 406,000 images of artworks from the Met collection to use, share and remix without restriction. And once again, just to kind of quickly give you a preview of what that actually looks like. 
Here we have the Met Collection. They have open access artwork, so something you can browse. And I'm going to click this arrow here to give me the advanced search option. Once you do that, you can actually click just like NYPL, open access. I'm going to go ahead and search for Hudson River School. Lots of great results. Click on summer afternoon. Um, You'll see right here, this OA for open access symbol, public domain is how it's identified as such. And once again, once you hit download, it will actually open up the high resolution file for you to save. And I've been actually using these for my screen savers, which has been really fun. Okay. So there's plenty more public domain resources. Um, I was particularly excited by the NYPL and MET releases here in New York City. Um, one of my favorite guides for a more complete list of where you can find public domain or Creative Commons li uh, licensed material is the Harvard Law School Libraries Guide. Um, it will help you uh, locate a variety of resources, including um, audiovisual material. So that's um, a great resource if you're interested in exploring more, more examples than what I'm doing here. And Creative Commons, just to mention quickly, is a way that um, creators of content can make their uh, material more accessible, even while it's in copyright, by allowing it to be used for a variety of educational and non-commercial purposes, as long as it is cited properly. So what are some of the results of, of these strides forward? There is basically more cool stuff being created with public domain and open materials. And I'm just gonna touch on a few examples to kind of get those um, just kind of inspirational um, juices flowing on what could be done with all of this great content. So one example is um, Navigating the Green Book, which was created with um, NYPL uh, public domain content. Um, the Green Book was a travel guide published between 1936 and 1966 that listed hotels, restaurants, bars, gas stations, et cetera, where black travelers would be welcome. And so what NYPL did here is extracted the data from these green books and visualized it through maps. So you can actually go onto this website and kind of create a trip and see um, where you would be able to stop along the way as an African-American traveling during this period, looking for these safe spots. Uh, one of my favorite online journals, the Public Domain Review, is dedicated to the exploration of curious and compelling works from the history of art, literature, and ideas, uh, focusing on works that are um, in the public domain and with a focus on the surprising, the strange, and the beautiful. Um, so I, I love this expression. They're hoping to provide an ever-growing cabinet of curiosities for the digital age. It's a really fun, interesting site to browse, which has scholarship, links to collections, um, ways to order digital prints. It's very cool. Uh, this is something that I just came across on Twitter. It is a doom metal apocalyptic fantasy role player game. And um, in the game book, apparently the um, the artist and designer, Johan Noor, strategically uh, draws on public domain art to supplement his own, um, including this image here of the Deluge, which is a painting by Francis Danby from 1840. And then he in turn also licenses the game itself uh, through a third party license to be able to allow community uh, members to kind of contribute to and use this, uh, this game um, through hacks, um, adventures, modules, etc. So I like that it's kind of being passed forward as well. And public domain cut up is uh, something you can find on Twitter. It is a Twitter bot that slices through layers of public domain images, creating new, confusing, and often interesting combinations. This is created by uh, Matt Miller. And this is an example of uh, what the bot conceived. It is um, combining the work Fringe from the Cooper Hewitt collection and Foraging from the Smithsonian. I just thought the result was really cool on this one. So donors of cultural heritage materials um, can contribute to open access through use of Creative Commons licenses or by releasing their work into the public domain. And archivists like me and curators can facilitate open access by having conversations with donors about how they want their material to be used and incorporating Creative Commons licenses and public domain options into donor agreements. And I would just state there that um, 
the caveat that there's plenty of reasons why not all content should be in the public domain or uh, more freely accessible. Uh, sometimes there are privacy issues, there's the rights of uh, intellectual um, rights of content creators, which are, are important and to be respected. Um, there's also sometimes cultural modalities, issues of self-determination within communities, um, why maybe a work wouldn't necessarily be generally shared across all of society in a totally open way. And all of that makes a lot of sense. However, I've found that there are a lot of um, folks who are contributing content to archives, um, maybe making donations where once they understand that there's ways to make it more easy for, for educators to use these materials in a variety of ways without having to have people seek permission. They're very interested and open to that idea. So I think it's our responsibility to incorporate this idea into our work. So that's all I have today. I wanna to thank you for listening. Um, again, to ask people who are interested in any of these topics to please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is annie.tumino at qc.cuny.edu and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much.